Let us now make our voices heard. I pledge to serve and to push my country. I pledge to live like a citizen. You open your eyes, and as always, I like to take my cue from the kids. <laughs> I'm serious, they're the ones that are like, that's, that's nuts. <laughs> um, so you found your programs uh, on your seat, and hopefully you've had a little time to look through those. If you haven't, um, we just want you to know there's some good language in there, and some good information. Um, to help you understand uh, what we're doing here today and to ground you in what we're trying to build outside of this room. Also in your program, you'll see, and it's a good thing that here we are at the Fremont Abbey that is full of arts and wonderful events that we have two artists with us today and we'll uh, have some powerful poetry 
uh, from our Civic Saturday poet, Na, and we'll sing together uh, with the help of a new friend uh, that's with us today, Justin Huertas. We'll have additional community members, those of you who've been asked to come up and read civic scripture. Eric Liu will deliver our civic sermon, and together we will all participate um, in our civic circles at the end uh, of, of, of the time together. So why are we doing this? We're doing this because we believe that we are in a moment, a time that calls for fellowship and connecting around a common civic purpose. We're gathering in this way, face to face, so that we can challenge each other, so we can connect and reflect. By being here, we are choosing not to succumb to the moral cynicism that has taken hold of civic life. We are declaring that there can be another way. And by being here today, you are helping us build that way. And we are saying, yes, we can do this. So thank you. Thank you for being here. And now, we'd like to welcome Na to come up and get us started. Peace, family. Peace. I gotta do, do the same thing I do with my students. Peace, family. Peace. Cool. <laughs> I'm gonna start off with a quote from a Trinidadian and Canadian photographer by the name of Michelle Pearson Clark. As we face the future together, we know more change is coming. And change inevitably brings loss. So I ask today, tomorrow, next week, next year, whose grief will you hold space for? And who will hold space for your grief, because we all have is each other. <clears throat> we are the haves wanting to be whole. We are the parts of you wanting to be unified to this universe. Maybe it was something that we were used to like a chant spoken in unison, all vocally connected in our individuality, where vulnerability is a freedom, a pit stop on the lonely journey. And the advantage is there is no disadvantage, judgment or shame to your strength to your fragility, to all the halves that you may hold and hold on to this humanity, this separate but equal, this equal but separate bundle of stories that are mine, that are yours, that are ours, that are others, that are human. Thank you. Thank you, Nat, as always. Um, hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> My name is Kayla Gianti. Um, I am on the team here at Citizen University. Um, and as Janae said, one of the things we love to do here today, for those of you who have not been with us, um, is have some time to really connect with each other. I think. You know, we come to events like this and we get a chance to listen, but we don't often get to sit and reflect with one another. So we're going to start out today by doing what we call a turn and talk. Uh, and this one's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to give you a question and we're going to have just a moment to sit and think about it. And then we'll share with each other. So take a moment in silence and think for one minute about someone who has helped you. Someone who has helped you.
All right, now what we'd like you to do is uh, turn to a neighbor or two, particularly someone you may not know yet, um, and share a little bit about uh, the person or the experience that you just uh, thought about for a minute. So we'll take a few minutes for that, share with your neighbor, and we'll come on back and see you. conversations. Thank you so much. I hope that you were able to meet somebody new. We'll have a chance later in the morning to uh, continue talking to each other. I love how uh, engaged you all are right off the bat. All right. Thank you so much. So as Janae said, we um, are very excited to um, have a new fabulous musician here with us today. Um, just by his song choices, I know that he's going to be a fun guy. So uh, <laughs> welcome, Justin Huertas. Hello. Hi, friends. Um, thank you all so much for having me here. Uh, this is awesome. I've never been here before, and I'm really happy I came. So, uh, the first song, okay, so we're going to sing songs together, which is exciting. And uh, the first song, I believe, in your program is Rainbow Connection. <laughs> Woo! We know that song, right? We know that song. <clears throat> Who doesn't know that song? Oh, okay, you'll learn it. <laughs> I literally, like, I know this song because of the Muppets. Um, Stand as you are able. Yeah, I literally know the song because of the Muppets. Um, I used to sing the song as a kid in Kermit's voice. So I won't make you do that. But if you want to do that, I'm not going to stop you. Here we go. That was amazing. Great job. Thank you. Oh, that makes me smile and cry at the same time. I love that song. Thank you all for doing that and singing so wonderfully. Um, all right, so um, before we bring Eric up on stage, we um, would love to bring up our two civic scripture readers, Catherine and Amiko, um, and you will be able to follow along with them in your program. So come on up to Catherine and Amiko. Alexis de Tocqueville, from Democracy in America, published 1835. I have also had occasion to show how the increasing love of well-being and the shifting character of property make democratic peoples afraid of material disturbances. Love of public peace is often the only political passion which they retain, and it alone becomes more active and powerful as all the others fade and die. This naturally disposes the citizens constantly to give the central government new powers, or let it take them, for it alone seems both anxious and able to defend them from anarchy by defending itself. Since in times of equality no man is obliged to put his powers at the disposal of another, and no one has any claim of right to substantial support from his fellow man, each is both independent and weak. These two conditions, which must be neither seen quite separately nor confused, give the citizen of a democracy extremely contradictory instincts. He is full of confidence and pride in his independence among his equals, but from time to time his weakness makes him feel the need for some outside help, which he cannot expect from any of his fellows, for they are both impotent and cold. In this extremity, he naturally turns his eyes toward that huge entity, which alone stands out above the universal level of abasement. His needs, and even more his longings, continually put him in mind of that entity, and he ends by regarding it as the sole and necessary support of his individual weakness. I'm 
gonna go rogue really quick and take a moment just to um, acknowledge and appreciate that we're on indigenous land and to put a thank you out there to the Coast Salish people for their stewardship of this land. Okay, so um, I am not a singer. I am also not very familiar with this song. If you are familiar, please join me, because I would love the vocal support. Um, I will be reading Me and Bobby McGee, written by Fred L. Foster and Chris Christofferson, performed by Janice Joplis, Joplin and attempted by me. Thank you, Tamika, for that impromptu uh, collective singing, and Catherine for your reading. And uh, thank you all this morning for joining us at Civic Saturday. Uh, thanks again, of course, to Na and to Justin and to our team at Citizen University, uh, Kayla, Tanum, Emily, uh, Janae, who are all here today. Um, and thanks to so many of you for whom this is your first Civic Saturday. Um, it is uh, truly heartening uh, that the idea of showing up to a gathering like this, uh, that we conceive of as a civic analog to church or to a faith gathering, uh, would draw you out uh, of your cozy Saturday morning lives uh, into this space together. Uh, I really want to thank you for being here this morning. I'm Eric Liu. Uh, I am the co-founder with Janae uh, of Citizen University. Uh, and as I look around this room and hear your voices and hear the ways in which we've been singing together in uh, ways planned and unplanned, uh, it's hard for me to think of a more fitting location for a Civic Saturday than Fremont Abbey. I want to tell you just a little bit about the space where we've gathered. Uh, some of you may know it was originally built uh, 104 years ago as St. Paul's Lutheran Church. And as that congregation dwindled over the decades, it was then bought in 2005 by a young progressive Lutheran Episcopal uh, church called Church of the Apostles, which had been based just across the street and wanted to turn this space into a sanctuary for community building and creativity. And the years since, uh, under their stewardship, and thanks to great amounts of neighbor power and volunteer love, uh, this has become the Fremont Abbey Art Center. We encourage you as you spend the rest of your morning here to take a look around and see all else that is going on here at Fremont Abbey. Uh, our work at Citizen University is suffused with this same spirit, not of church religion, but of American civic religion, of service and love and the creation of collective power in civic life among our neighbors, where we seek together to redeem the American creed of liberty and justice for all. Redemption, even in these times where our attention is focused to that great distant entity, the federal government, the people who control the federal government, all that happens in our nation's capital, redemption of the creed begins at home. Redemption begins in the heart. We began this morning with a reflection and discussion about someone who has helped you. Now, how many of you here have seen the uh, recent uh, documentary about Mr. Rogers? Yeah, more, more than a few. So those of you who saw that documentary called Won't You Be My Neighbor know where that came from. It's a beautiful film uh, about his life and public presence. And uh, in the course of that film, interviewing all the people who knew uh, Fred Rogers over the course of his life and career, uh, they close this film by asking each of those people to, in Mr. Rogers' fashion, think of someone who has helped you. And they ask them to think about that person and hold that person in their mind for a full minute. And as the camera stayed on each of those people, some of them just started quavering, some of them started crying. And if you watch that film, you start shaking and crying too, right? In the way that we were all moved in thinking about that person. Thinking about such a person for just one minute makes us realize, actually, how isolating everyday life in America is how imprisoned we often are by all this liberty we enjoy, and how hungry we all are to help and to be helped. This morning, I'd like to talk about three deeply connected themes. Freedom, 
loneliness, and help. Let's start with freedom. Our first reading today comes from Alexis de Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Side note, we, we could pretty much spend every Civic Saturday for all time just talking about Tocqueville. In fact, we could do a year-long seminar or book club together on democracy in America, uh, and I plant that seed to see if any of you might want to do that. Um, because that book, Democracy in America, is about as bottomless a source of insight about American civic life and American civic character and indeed human nature as can be found. But anyway, I want to emphasize in particular one part of the reading we heard today. Quote, since in times of equality no man is obliged to put his powers at the disposal of another, and no one has any claim of right to substantial support from his fellow man, each is both independent and weak. Independent and weak. Is there a better description for how America makes Americans feel? We are so free, free to walk around Seattle, each unaware of the other, as we look at our screens and listen to our private curated soundtracks and podcasts, free to live in gated communities, free to sleep on the streets and under bridges. The offices of Citizen University are across the street from a homeless shelter and a full block of tents. We, when we go to work, we look freedom in the face every day. And I hear the words of me and Bobby McGee on my way to and from work. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. When I was a kid, and my dad used to play the album of Chris Christopherson singing that song, I would think to myself, that was a pretty grim, even cynical view of freedom. Today, I think grim, yes, maybe not that cynical. The condition of independence and weakness long precedes Tocqueville's visit to the young United States in the 1830s. John Winthrop, the Puritan pilgrim, most famous for his City Upon a Hill speech, gave another memorable speech in 1645 when he was governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Actually, he was being impeached for abuse of power. And in his defense, he spoke of the difference between a liberty of corrupt nature that allows men and beasts to do what they list, and a moral liberty that is harnessed to justice and goodness. To put it simply, what he said was, doing whatever the hell you want is not freedom, it is enslavement. And that speech actually got him acquitted. From the outset, the Puritans who landed on this native land feared that moral liberty a liberty that is about being free not to do as one lists, but is about being liberated from beastly appetites, a liberty of self-control and the ability to govern oneself, a liberty of limits. The Puritans feared that that kind of liberty, that moral liberty, would be exceedingly hard to sustain in the face of the unlimited opportunity and unlimited bounty and choice that this continent promised. And their fears were borne out. The American politician today, most likely to be impeached, is the world's most vivid embodiment of corrupt natural liberty, of unrestrained, unapologetic appetite. And he is president because he represents how enthralled, how enslaved so many Americans are, all of us, to unfettered, unapologetic appetite. How we cannot tell the difference between license and liberty. Now, by the way, I always bristle when people talk about this being Trump's America, and not because of Trump. I quarreled when people called it Obama's America, because the idea gets the causal arrow backwards. Donald Trump is America's Trump. Barack Obama is America's Obama. Other nations have people just like them, with all their qualities and traits and predispositions all their talents for good and not good. But only in America could someone with that particular mix of traits and DNA rise to such power. We made each man, Donald Trump and Barack Obama. We, our collective appetites and aspirations, our extremely contradictory aspirations and instincts, as Tocqueville put it, we gave rise to these men and many more like them. 
independent and weak. It can be hard to notice this condition because it's simply the air we breathe and the water we drink here in the United States. But consider the arc of the experience of an immigrant family. For the immigrant who breathes this air and drinks this water for the first time, it is shocking in the first place to taste this unfettered liberty, to say, to do, to eat, to wear whatever one lists. And then, in the second place, it is a little saddening for the immigrant to watch his or her child absorb this liberty. Recently, I received a, as a gift a t-shirt that says, Child of Immigrants. It's made by a company in Chicago called Lawrence and Argyle that is, devoted to, that is devoting a part of its profits to support immigrant and refugee causes. As I've been wearing this t-shirt around the country, the varying reactions have been kind of interesting. I wore it first on a crosstown walk with Janae here in Seattle, through Madrona, the Central District, and Capitol Hill. And I received quite a few smiles and nods and positive comments and gestures of encouragement. A few weeks later, I was in Oklahoma City, walking through a newly hip but sparsely populated area near downtown. The people I encountered there didn't register any visible reaction, positive or negative. Then, after that, I was in midtown Manhattan, where people were pretty much too busy and bustling and moving too fast to notice or engage me. But several immigrant street vendors saw me, and when they saw me, they smirked, as if to say, how American. <laughs> how American. My generation does all the heavy lifting so that our children can grow up to wear these cute, self-congratulatory t-shirts. <laughs> I felt it. And finally, a few weeks later in the DC suburbs, a couple of weeks ago, the people shopping at the Whole Foods where I was at smiled very warmly at me as I wore that t-shirt. But that's probably because I was with my mother, one of those immigrants to whom the t-shirt refers. And for the record, mom likes the t-shirt, uh, <laughs> although she also sympathizes with those smirking street vendors. But as I thought about it, I realized it would never occur to my mother or to my parents' generation of Chinese immigrants to wear a t-shirt that said, immigrant. They who, they, people like my mother and her friends in that generation, they know who they are and they know what they are. And even if they detest the politicians today who feed anti-immigrant hatred and sentiment, they do not put individual self-expression atop their hierarchy of needs. To put it another way, immigrants are often freer than the native-born from the pressure to always be a special individual in America, always displaying our unique identity and our viewpoints and our validity. They, the immigrants, are often freer from all the suffocating pressure to show that you are special, just like everyone else. That is in large part because immigrants Immigrants of every caste and hue and creed are usually not alone. They are woven into a fabric of relationship and obligation. They are situated in a weave of tradition, custom, norms, and habits that may seem and may even be limiting, and yet, in the American context, can also be deeply liberating. We who were born and blessed to be born here in this land are actually more likely to die alone. We who had the luck to be American from the start are actually more likely to suffer the rest of our lives from loneliness. And that is the second theme I'd like to speak about this morning. We are a lonely people. We are an atomized people. We are people whose connective institutions have decayed and who are left exposed, each of us alone, to predatory marketers and predatory politicians and predatory lenders and predatory hate mongers. We are a nation now of easy marks. A recent UCLA study found that more than half of Americans today are lonely and that younger adults suffer more than any other group from feelings of isolation. The UCLA loneliness scale which has scores from 20 to 80, with 43 and above 
indicating loneliness, shows that the average American score is 43. For people who are in their early 20s, that score is 48. That's compared to a score of 39 for people in their 70s and older. But, you know, here I go, doing that very American thing of giving you a number with a credential attached to it <laughs> to prove what your senses and your gut and your heart already tell you. Tocqueville predicted that the combination of an ethos of individualism and a market economy would lead to both audacious innovation and deep spiritual emptiness. In short, he predicted social media. But I don't mean to blame social media alone, or even primarily. It is, like the presidency, as much a mirror of our wants as a maker of them. Earlier this week, my colleagues from the Aspen Institute and I convened a group of practitioners and academics, including a team from Facebook, actually, for a project we call Connections. The point of the project is to explore how technology which has done so much to sort and sift us into pure, mutually antagonistic tribes and sub-tribes, might be used to build cohesion and common purpose out of heterogeneous groups. The point of the project is to ask whether tech can rehumanize civic life and not just dehumanize it. But what became clear as this symposium unfolded was that tech is not really the source of the problem. The underlying ailment of the body politic what makes us prone to Russian bots and to homegrown agitators online and offline is the profound loneliness and isolation and social disconnection that defines American life and the decline and disappearance of shared experiences like this. Experiences that bridge people across the various markers of identity. Every public health crisis today has its roots in this loneliness and social disconnection, whether it's the opioid crisis, the white male suicide spike, the rise in mass shootings, the surge of diabetes, the rise of homelessness. The former Surgeon General Vivek Murtha, Murthy wrote an article last year stating that loneliness and weak social connections are associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day and even greater than that associated with obesity. And there's no way to trace the roots of all this loneliness and isolation without coming back to that all-American creed of rugged individualism. Recently, U.S. Senator Ben Sass gave a speech about this epidemic of loneliness and how it, fe and how it feeds hyperpolarization and hyperpartisanship in our politics. He's from Fremont, too. Fremont, Nebraska. And it may be easy for Seattle progressives gathered here today to dismiss Ben Sass, not just because he's a Nebraska Republican, but also because he's one of that small group of GOP senators who are very willing to criticize Donald Trump, but almost never willing to vote against him or to block him. Still, put aside whether Ben Sass is a profile in courage or not. The thing is, he is right. He is right. Loneliness is killing us and our democracy. And he knows it acutely, Ben Sass does, because he's an elected official. And elected officials at every level receive the cries of all the lonely people. I'm not an elected official. But just from my presence in public life, I experienced this. Yesterday, a man came to the front desk of our office. And he demanded to meet with someone from our staff. My colleague Ben met with him. And this man was earnest, intelligent, not unhinged, but not exactly coherent either. And he proceeded, standing there talking to Ben, he proceeded to unspool a tangled philosophy of all that ails America all the ways in which crises of family and institutions and market have compounded, and all the things that were going wrong, and all the ways in which these terrible webs of disease are connected. And he concluded by saying that he needed us to hear him, to understand him. He needed me to know that he had been here to help assure him that he saw the world's problems correctly. And he left a letter that was more cogent than his front lobby plea. 
But what struck me both about that plea and that letter, what struck me about this visitor was that he is us. Each of us, each of us here has a private philosophy about all that ails the world. Each of us imagines that we have deep insights about the human condition. And each of us longs to be heard. Each of us longs to have our, each of us longs to have our capacity to see and to make sense, to be seen and to be made sense of. How lucky are we who've gathered here today to know that we have that. Even if you didn't have that at 1029, when you walked in here and you sat down, you attained it. How lucky are we? But then this question, what can we do to ensure that other, others have this as well? This opportunity to be seen, to have their dignity and humanity acknowledged. How can we connect? Well, we can start by remembering that this is a problem for which neither the market nor the government may be the solution of first resort. Why? Because the market and the government combine to create the problem. The market, by hyper-personalizing us into tiny, atomized niches. The government, by depersonalizing the relationships of mutual aid that used to hold neighborhoods and groups and communities together. Both, together, have hollowed out the commons. And this, too, was what Tocqueville foresaw. He saw that prideful, rugged individualism would lead to isolation, and would lead people to become afraid, and in turn, lead them to yearn for a stronger state that would protect them. He foresaw that people would begin to veer wildly between illusions of security, chasing something that was only to be found right here. To connect and reconnect, then, we have to fill in this abandoned third space between market and government. That space looks, well, it looks a little bit like the Fremont Abbey. It looks like Civic Saturday. It looks like every hobby club and social circle and community center that exists in this city, in this city of so many newcomers who are not connected to one another or to the people who preceded them here. This third space is a space where we help each other. And that is the final theme I want to explore today. Help. Janae's mother, Sarah Ann Kane, passed away this August. And I would like to read to you a few lines from her obituary. <clears throat> I wanted two things in life, to raise children and to keep a nice house. Sarah Ann Kane's legacy was that and much more. She raised five children and nurtured 13 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. And to the end of her days, she created comfortable, cozy spaces full of art and beauty, places where people wanted to linger and converse. Sarah Ann passed away on August 26, 2018, one day after her 85th birthday, surrounded by her loving family at Ollie Steele Burden Manor, in Baton Rouge. Born Sarah Ann Kahn on August 25, 1933, in Ruston, Louisiana, she was a graduate of Baton Rouge High and LSU. She was exceptionally resilient and courageous. She and her brother contracted polio in 1949. She emerged with a disabled leg and arm, he in an iron lung. As she raised her family and helped care for her brother, Sarah Ann overcame those obstacles. She rarely complained and always wore lipstick. She made friends easily and was admired by all who met her. Sarah Ann Kane was all that and much more. Those of you who know Janae know she is her mother's daughter, especially if you've seen pictures of them. But tucked into that obituary is a mention of Sarah Ann's brother, Janae's uncle Frederick, who emerged from his ordeal with polio, paralyzed from the neck down. The rest of his story is that he lived 43 years in that iron lung, most of them in the home where Janae and her siblings grew up. 
Frederick did not merely survive, he thrived. He ran small businesses from his home. He sold real estate while lying in that iron lung. He read voraciously by having a contraption built in which a book would be strapped onto a plate above him. And he would turn the pages with a special stick in his mouth, using an eraser on the end of that stick to gently lift a page out from the rubber bands on one side and tuck its corner under the rubber bands on the other side. And in the last years of his life, he became a painter, holding a paintbrush the same way in his teeth. We have in our house an impressionist landscape that he painted in ochre and bronze tones, a pond in late autumn, perhaps, a valley. And that painting is arresting, but when you consider how it was made, it becomes simply staggering. He was, in the most elemental physical way, profoundly unfree. But in ways that last, and perhaps matter most, he was truly free. His mind, his imagination, his ambition, his love of life. How did Janae's Uncle Frederick attain all that he did? How? By asking for help. By requiring help so unambiguously that, like a magnet, he drew out the latent helping part of all the people around him. His sister, his nieces and nephews, his colleagues and friends. If most Americans are, by Tocqueville's reckoning, independent and weak, then Frederick Kahn's life should remind us of the power of being dependent and strong. This is a twist on the usual message we get in good, earnest, civic gatherings like this one. The usual message is, help someone. My message today is, ask someone for help. That's the harder thing for us Americans to do, as prideful individualists who cannot face the realities of our own weakness. I'm not good at it. And it's not because I'm a child of immigrants. The Chinese community where I grew up in upstate New York was small but very, very mutualistic. It's more that I was the son of a father who had kidney disease and was on home dialysis the last 14 years of his life, of his foreshortened life, and who did not want anyone at work or in our neighborhood to know that he was sick, lest they regard him as weak or vulnerable. So we at home learn to help him at home. But we never learn to ask our neighbors for help. I've been trying to unlearn those lessons of my childhood for a long time. And the work we do today at Citizen University is in many ways about unlearning lessons of rugged American individualism. It's why we gather here for Civic Saturday. Are there more obvious civic messages I could be delivering to you? Yes, starting with Vote. Vote early. Get your friends to vote. But there may not be. In fact, I'm, I don't think there is a more important message in these times than ask someone for help. In Britain, where the government has taken the radical step of creating a ministry of loneliness, writers and activists and social entrepreneurs are trying creatively to refill that emptied out third space to rebuild the civic commons. An author from Britain named Hilary Cottam has written a book called Radical Help. And in it, she describes a variety of experiments in care for the aging, in mentorship of the young, in the workplace and in the home, where everyday citizens are trying to help each other by forming clubs and mutual aid circles without relying only or even primarily on the welfare state. None of the experiments she describes on its own is a game changer. But that's the nature of things. That is the way of systems. If a hundred or a thousand Britons follow her example and develop their own experiments, then their society will be on a path to renewal and not decay. The same is true for us. We have to rebuild the webs of mutual aid that make a sanctuary like Fremont Abbey, a neighborhood like Fremont, a city like Seattle, a state like Washington, 
and a nation like the United States remain resilient enough not to shatter in a crisis. Because the crisis is here. The crisis of our democracy, the crisis of our economy, the crisis of our soul, it is here. It is upon us. And we will rebuild only one way, face to face. We will do that by identifying something that needs doing, however small, and by asking someone else to help us do it. We will do that with all the open-heartedness and all the unseen savvy of Mr. Rogers, asking simple questions for children that crack open the hardened hearts of adults. Won't you be my neighbor? A week ago, several members of our Citizen University team were in Memphis, Tennessee to hold a gathering called Citizen Fest. And at the close of this gathering, we showed the participants there how to run a mutual aid circle, how to put a project or a need into the middle of that circle, how to ask others for help in that circle, and how to sharpen that ask into something that people can concretely respond to. How to invite those people, then, to make hard commitments of help. And ultimately, how good it feels to make that commitment. One of the participants at Citizen Fest was a woman named Lindsay, who had grown up on the rough streets of West Memphis, but spent many years away and only recently had moved back with her three children. Those two boys and one girl, all of them pre-teens, were there with her at Citizen Fest. And when I asked Lindsay, in, pr in front of everybody gathered there, why she had come and why she had brought her children, she said it was to teach them how to step outside your smallest circle, the same way she had taught them to meet and greet their new neighbors in West Memphis, so they will know you if you need their help. To ask someone for help is to help them. This, we know, is the magic secret of social cohesion. To ask someone for help is also to recognize our limits, which is to live within those limits, which is to be free of illusions, which in the end is to be truly free. To ask someone for help is to practice not the rapacious liberty of the sociopath, but the moral liberty of the citizen. You can read your Tocqueville. You can brush up on your John Winthrop. You can sing your Chris Christopherson. Or you can hear a story like the story of Uncle Frederick, who reminds us that the helpless are not powerless. Or you can meet a single parent like Lindsay, who reminds us, as the saying goes, that there is no such thing as a single parent, that every person in that situation is held and held up by a web of relationship and obligation to kin and to acquaintances and to the strangers nearby who don't yet know that they can be of help. Those strangers nearby are really citizens in waiting, dormant friends. Let us awaken them. Let us awaken our freedom. Let us ask each other for help. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and I'd now like to invite Justin back on stage. Uh, you'll see the lyrics for Lean On Me in there. So stand as you are able, and we are gonna sing this awesome song. So, Bill Withers, it's Bill Withers. But like, I know the Club Nouveau cover. Like, do you know that one? That, uh, so I don't know what's gonna come out right now, but we'll find out together. Here we go. Oh, and this is one of those songs, if you like harmonies, then harmonize. If you like riffing, then riff. <laughs> Live your life, you know? Okay, great, here we go. <laughs> Rock stars. Rock stars. Harmonies, riffs. Thank you so much for having me. the best.
best thing that's ever happened. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So um, for the last piece of the program, we're going to get into what we call civic circles. So in a moment, um, I'm going to ask everybody to group up in a group of about five or six. Um, whoever ends up in your circle is who's supposed to be in your circle. And uh, we're going to talk to each other for just a little bit, and then we'll come back to, to close it up. So what I'd like you to chat with each other in your circles is to go around and tell each other about a civic challenge or issue you want to address and then ask for help. Let everybody who wants to get a chance to say their piece and, and ask each other what we can do to help each other. So go ahead and group up in about f groups of five or six. Uh, you can move chairs around as need be and we'll come back in about 15 or so minutes to close out. Yes, the prompt is tell each other about a civic challenge or issue that you want to address. A civic challenge or issue you want to address and then ask each other for help. I want to do a Thanksgiving feed. We do one every year and I have to buy three turkeys and I would love to get them donated. I could probably connect to somebody like, are you going through the same situation? Can our parents meet? Yeah, that's what That'd I be thinking. really good. We were like, let's hang out today and Wendy brought up coming here. It was like, we had to be intentional about making that happen um, in order to open the door to this conversation that we're now having. Okay, yes, 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 applause for everyone who is, good job, good job. Thank you, I'm torn. I wanna to continue letting everybody chat, but we gotta keep it going. So, as I said, we'll have time um, at the end. You're welcome to stay and continue chatting with each other and connecting. Um, so at the end here, uh, we want to give folks an opportunity. Uh, we call this community announcement time. So if you have a, a brief, a brief thing you'd like to share about um, a group you're in or an event that's coming up that you want to um, let folks know about, and they can follow up with you afterwards, we're going to do that in a moment. I'll start. A uh, couple notes: We're going to post um, Eric's sermon online um, on our Facebook page and on our website uh, later this afternoon. So if you'd like to revisit that, you can find it there. Uh, if you have high schoolers in your life, sophomores or juniors, we have a program called our Youth Collaboratory that we just put out applications for. Um, yes, are you gonna apply? Cool. Um, it's a, it's a year-long program teaching skills of civic power. High schoolers all over the country come together for um, a great program year, so you can find that online. Uh, our next Civic Saturday is going to be on December 8th, uh, location TBD. And also just want to share, we have a program called Civic Seminary, where we've been training folks from all over the country to hold these Civic Saturday gatherings in towns around the country. We actually have several uh, Seattle Civic Seminarians, one of which is Tamara Power Judas right here. <laughs> So as we share more about um, our gatherings for next year, you'll start to see um, some other uh, uh, community-led Civic Saturdays um, by Tamara um, and Kristen and others. So be on the lookout for that. Um, so I'd like to open it up if anybody has anything they'd want to briefly share about to the room. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Great, well as we mentioned, um, please feel free to, to stick around and continue chatting with each other. Um, our next gathering will be on December 8th. Um, you've definitely already seen it, but please come support Elliott Bay. Um, there's some excellent books here. Maggie brought a great selection, um, so feel free to stop by. Also grab an amplifier poster on your way out. Those um, were uh, given to us and are for you for free, so please take them home. Um, let's see, and let's give a big round of applause to Na and Justin and the Abby and all of our speakers today. And thank all of you for showing up and providing the most beautiful Civic Saturday song I've ever heard. Uh, you set the bar, so thank you, and we'll see you on December 8th.